everyone. Welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a furry friend of ours because we are covering the oh so wonderful raccoon. This is, of course, a very, very special listener episode dedicated to Molly Sasser Gaynor and Luke, who as a family wrote in Alana, Sarah, Raul, Cody, and Nicholas. Suffice to say that this was a very requested episode. It only makes me worry that I left somebody out. Thank you all for sending this wonderful suggestion. I'm so excited to get into the show so we can learn about them together. If you would like to send in an animal suggestion to have your own episode and to learn about a creature you think is super cool, make sure to either send a message to Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram or you can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and click on the Animal Request tab. And you can always send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. I cherish all of your emails and animal requests, so don't be shy. Please send them my way. If you love extinct animals and dinosaurs and woolly mammoths, we are starting a Relax With Animal Facts mini-series on Patreon on extinct animals, so if you would like to learn more about that, the link is in the show notes, or you can just search up patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts. I'm just going to say where I got my facts from so we can get right into this episode. All of the facts that are in this episode I got from mentalfloss.com, haveaheart.com, treehugger.com, facts.net, etimonline.com, and wordsense.eu. All of those resources are going to be in the show notes or the description of this episode, so if you want to learn more about the raccoon and I'm sure about many other creatures and cool things, I encourage you to click on those links and follow them to your heart's content. And now I would like for all of you to notice maybe where you're carrying some tension. Is it in the shoulders? Is it in the head? It may be your arms. Everyone is truly different in this area. We all carry tension in different places. But for the next 20 minutes or so as we go and learn together about the raccoon, it's not all that necessary to have shoulders all the way up to the ears. For me, it's in my hands and my arms, so I encourage you to, right alongside me, try to relax those parts of your body as you go into this immersive experience with me, Steph Wolf, into the forests where the raccoon resides. Today we are walking around in the wooded areas of North America, the crunches of sticks beneath our feet with those familiar creaks of the branches. But keep in mind that raccoons have also emerged in parts of Europe and even in Japan. We have covered in the past the tanuki, which is nicknamed the raccoon dog, but that is an entirely separate species. So Japan has a raccoon and a raccoon dog. But traditionally, raccoons are going to prefer those very heavily wooded areas wherever there is access to trees and veggies and water. They like to make their dens, their homes, in those really hollow parts of the trees or any burrows that other animals have dug up. The raccoon will just make use of it, they'll recycle it, and go right in there and make their home. And across the world, they have up to, currently, 22 extant subspecies. That word extant just is the opposite or antonym of extinct, so the raccoon has 22 currently living and breathing subspecies. But many of you will notice, at least many of you in North America, that we don't only see raccoons in woodlands. 
We see them on the streets, in our garbage cans, or on our roofs, or under our decks. That is because raccoons are extremely adaptable. They're often found in urban areas and suburban areas where they will make their homes in sewers and barns and sheds. But when they are in those urban areas, their range tends to diminish. When we speak of range, we speak of the general land or the general area that the raccoon will consider its home and will travel around. It is more when they are actually in a forest, in which case they have been seen to travel up to 18 miles to forage for food. But in general, I can't assume that everyone listening to this podcast has seen a raccoon before, but they are round, fuzzy creatures. They have that signature black mask of fur on their face that gives them the common colloquial distinction of bandit. Sometimes in urban areas, they are referred to in slang terms as trash bandits, which might be a little bit less of an amiable distinction. And an important thing is that while they do look very cute, approaching a wild raccoon up close is often not a good idea for a multitude of reasons, but the first and foremost is that they can be pretty scary when you approach them up close. When they feel threatened, they can let out some very strange noises and bite if they so choose. So it's best to view them from a distance. It is actually raining where I am recording from, so if you hear any thunderous noises in the background, we can simply imagine that there is a thunderstorm somewhere off far in the distance. But moving on, the common name is of course the one we have been using so far, which is raccoon, but their scientific name is Procyon Lotor. We are going to cover the etymology of those words right now because we are covering the etymology of the word raccoon at the end. So that first word, Procyon, is a bright star in the constellation known as Canis Minor and actually is one of the brightest stars in the sky taking 8th place. And this word comes from Latin which then comes from Greek. And the Greek word that was used was prokion, and that second bit, kion, means dog. And the second word was lotor. In Latin, lotor means laundry man, or man who washes things. If you haven't already seen some videos online, the raccoon loves to wash its food. When it gets something, it will take the food with its little dexterous hands and move it around and shuffle it around in the water before they eat it. So the scientific name of the raccoon is quite literally translated as dog laundry man, which is one of the most amazing distinctions I think any animal has gotten on the show so far. So this dog laundry man is a mammal and it is an omnivore. Omnivores, of course, eat both plant and animal material. This is where knowing root words really helps. Omni just means all or of all things. So they have a diet of all or of all things. So not only do they have an omnivorous diet, but they are also opportunistic eaters. This means that they will feed on whatever really is most convenient whatever is laying around. So that might include grasshoppers and frogs, insects, maybe some berries, fruits, and nuts. And if they are in an urban area, they will assume the role of a scavenger, rummaging through your trash and your compost, taking pet food that you might have left throughout the night. If any of you have bird feeders like I do, you likely already know the sort of incredible gymnastics that they will do to get to that bird seed, and they will be doing all of these gymnastic maneuvers and eating during the night time. They are nocturnal creatures, so they are awake and eat during the night time and mainly sleep during the day. When it does get its paws on some great food that it would like to eat, 
we learned that they like to rinse their food, which they do, and they do with fervor. But if there is no water close by and they have food they want to eat, they will still rub the food between their hands to try to remove any debris that might be there. And the paws that they have in which they rub the food around and rummage around are some of the most unique in the animal kingdom. Biologists believe that the raccoon has some seriously sensitive nerves on their fingers and on their front paws. And you'll see them frequently moving their hands around, touching everything. They're gathering a ton of sensory information. There was a study of 136 raccoons. There was a study done with a sample size of 136 raccoons where researchers in Nova Scotia found that when their hands were wet, there was a greater responsiveness of the nerves. So their dunking of their food has a kind of twofold purpose, it would seem to me. The first is, of course, to wash the food and sort of get the debris out of it. And second, the responsiveness of those nerves are going to be very acute when they have water on them. And second, when their skin is wet, the responsiveness of their nerves are going to be very acute, helping them to really know what is going on with their hands. Dogs follow their nose. Raccoons might follow their hands. Their hands will have five toes on their front and back paws, but their forepaws, meaning their front ones, have a dexterity that is peculiar or better than the ones at the back, and they work similarly to some slender human hands, but keep in mind they do not have opposable thumbs. So while we might have five fingers and the raccoon have five fingers, we have a kind of movement that we can do known as opposition. So taking your hand and pressing your thumb into your pinky finger, for example, is a movement that the raccoon is not capable of doing. And our opposable thumbs are going to give us some great gripping abilities, but the raccoon is also going to do just fine with their nimble, finger-like toes. They can open things and manipulate food to their heart's content. They can open lids, jars, doorknobs, boxes. But speaking of being able to open containers, that shows a certain level of intelligence. And the raccoon is indeed incredibly smart. They're also pinned very closely against domestic cats. And some researchers say that their abilities may not even just be equal, but even better than those of cats. There was a study that was published in 2017 in the Animal Cognition Journal where they took eight raccoons and put them to the test. The raccoons were shown a cylinder that was filled with water containing a single marshmallow that was just a bit too low to grasp. The researchers would show themselves putting pebbles into the cylinder so that the water level would rise giving the raccoon the ability to actually reach and grab the marshmallow. And of these eight raccoons that were part of this test, two learned to drop the stones inside the cylinder to reach their furry little hands in and grab that sweet, sweet marshmallow. A third raccoon had found an even easier way by tipping over the tube to access the marshmallow just a bit more quickly. In the raccoon world, there is no cheating on tests. There is only ingenuity and innovation. And so the researchers concluded that of these eight raccoons, the fact that three of them had got the marshmallow in one way or another by following the rules and sort of breaking them, that they were innovative in aspects of the task. So here the researchers were trying to figure out whether or not these raccoons would understand water displacement, not understand like physicists would understand it, but to know experientially that once there's more things in here, the treat gets closer to my face, and then showing their intelligence. 
I am a bit skeptical of one aspect of this test, and that is that the researchers demonstrated it before letting the raccoons do it on their own. Because now we're not exactly testing the creativity or the innovation of the raccoon, but rather we are testing its ability to mimic or to imitate. It makes it a bit more challenging to discern whether the raccoon was putting rocks in it because it knew that the water would rise and that it would get the marshmallow, or if it figured that rocks in this hole give me marshmallow. This test has been done with other animals, like ravens, I believe, and ravens showed a peculiar ability of figuring it out completely on their own. They would also have stones and tubes, and ravens were shown to, without prompt, be able to take advantage of water displacement to get a tasty treat. But regardless, the raccoon is indeed incredibly intelligent. Add to that their signature bandit-like face and their weapons-grade curiosity, and you can have one pesky garbage thief. There is one theory regarding the dark masks that they have on their face, and that is that the distinctive dark markings help deflect the sun's glare and possibly even enhance night vision. But alternatively, some researchers say that these dark masks may help the animals hide their eyes from predators. But one study in the biological journal concluded that these dark patterns are very likely more in the anti-glare division, which is super cool. We have to wear sunglasses, but they sport their very own unique one. If you see a group of raccoons, you can feel free to call them a nursery of raccoons, because that is what researchers decided it to be which I am not at all opposed to. And although raccoons live two to three years in the wild, a raccoon can live up to 20 years in captivity. We see the trend of living longer in captivity, but this is an extremely stark difference. They live about seven times on average longer in captivity than they do in the wild. I would suppose it would have to do with conditions such as diet as well as disease. There is nothing much to worry about there. So let us move on to the name of the raccoon. What exactly does the name mean or why do we call the raccoon the raccoon? Well, the raccoon has some of the most dexterous hands in nature. And just in case you aren't sure what dexterous or dexterity means, dexterity means skill and grace in physical movement, especially in the use of the hands. It can also be said of mental ability, but when we say that the raccoon has dexterous hands, it means that they have a tremendous amount of skill and grace with which they use them. Native Americans were some of the first to note their unusual paws, and our English word raccoon comes from the Powhatan word arukun, which literally translated means animal that scratches with its hands, and we can see how this name is a very apt one. The Aztecs similarly, when naming the raccoon in their own language, named it Mapachitli, or being translated, one who takes everything in its hands. It can be seen in the Spanish word for raccoon too, which I really don't want to butcher because I do not know the phonetics of Spanish. If I was to guess, it would be mapache, maybe. Any of you Spanish listeners, feel free to send me a very angry email if I totally butchered that. So we can see how the hands of the raccoon are not only skillful in picking up things with great accuracy and precision, their hands also give them unique distinctions that led them to be called what they are. So let us move on to the review portion of the show in which I read a review from one of you special listeners out there. 
They are typically from Apple Podcasts, but you can also leave a review wherever you listen. But for this episode, the review is coming all the way from the United States of America from a user named Prince Herb. And Prince writes, Great idea and perfectly executed. You can learn or just tune out and relax. If you keep scrolling, you'll see a weird three-star review from someone who gets really uptight about ferrets. Don't be like them. And I'm not entirely sure what three-star review Prince is referring to. I don't remember reading anything to do with someone uptight about ferrets. But thank you, Prince, for the wonderful review. I greatly appreciate your feedback and the fact that you took time to write it in the first place. And I do find that some of you like to learn attentively, some of you like to learn very passively, and some of you just really like the background noise for sleeping. I know many of you do a mixture of all of those from what I've gathered from your emails and messages, but regardless of how you choose to listen, I do it this way so that you could do it any way that you want. This show is not only for you, but this show is also by you in terms of animal requests and all of that. If you would like to leave a review because you love the show, it is one of the greatest ways that you can give back, whether you love it or whether you hate it. Leaving a review is something that can not only help the show grow, but can help it improve. The format change that we did of the show came from some very pointed one-star reviews for which I am very grateful because I understand that many of you like the format change. But know that all of it is from your generosity and your company, you keeping me company as we go into woodlands and jungles and seas is really gift enough. Again, if you would like to have your own episode and to learn about an animal that you find very cool, make sure to send a message to Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram or go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and go to the Animal Request tab. Or you can also just send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. If you would like to learn about some of our planet's most amazing extinct animals that are not around anymore, you can go to the Patreon Relax With Animal Facts, where we will be learning about some of the most amazing creatures that walked this earth. Thank you all for joining me on this episode. What a wonderful creature. I hope that all of you will join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.